<clears throat> hey, and welcome. This is uh, another edition of our live broadcast over here from my office. Guys, it's Jeff from Home Renovision. Good to see you. We've got a few people in the chat already before the show gets started. Uh, Daisy wants to know why we don't have Matt in more of the videos. It's kind of up to him, Daisy. He, uh, he likes being behind the scenes. <laughs> anyway, cheers to 2021. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for making it. Been a hell of a ride, eh? Anyway, tonight we are going to dive in. I've got a, a two-hour program. Yeah, I'm going to try to make it two hours. I'm crazy, but there's a lot of stuff to go through. I know you all have a lot of questions, so tonight is uh, uh, open to everybody. All right? So there's no blue phone tonight. There's no special members chat. There's no nothing. <laughs> tonight is going to be just simple. I got some information I want to get through that I can help you out with about how to renovate the right way. It's going to be so important. I think a lot of people are making major plans this year, and I am going to be answering a ton of questions. So rules of engagement for tonight are this. If you have a question that you want to have answered, um, no matter what's going on tonight, then put it in the super chat. But please, 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 please try to give me a few minutes to get through my information first. Okay. Um, I'm not a multitasker to that degree. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep up in the chat the best I can. But I do have some presentation here because there's information I think is good. And if I give all the good information first, then maybe, just maybe, people will watch enough of this video that YouTube will suggest it and help save a lot of people a lot of time, aggravation, money, disappointment, sorrow, blood, sweat, and tears. Right? Because we all want to do it right. Is that even possible? All right, so let's just jump into it. I have presentation. I got notes to keep me on track. Yeah, right? Notes. This is me making notes. It's old fashioned. It's paper and pen and scribbles. So I'll just uh, keep myself going. Uh, real quick in the chat. Hey, we got Sandy made it to join us tonight. Happy New Year, Sandy. Um, happy New Year. Look at all these people. My goodness, you guys blow my mind. There's over 300, well, 350 of you. This must be a conversation everybody needs to have. Or maybe we just all needed a chance to spend some time together. <laughs> I don't know what it's like where you are, but where I live, huh, government shut down everything again. We're in complete lockdown. It's ridiculous. Um, the only we, we, We're allowed to go for essentials, right? We can go shopping. We can buy stuff for home repair, which is good for us because I still got a house to fix. And we're allowed to go buy alcohol because without that, the government would be in a lot of trouble because the people would revolt. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, you guys can continue to chat and talk to each other. I'm going to take a couple minutes out and go through my information. My wife is also in the chat tonight. So if you misbehave, she will get rid of your message. So save yourself the aggravation and embarrassment. And uh, let's just all have a lot of fun tonight. So how to renovate the right way. I get this question all the time. It's like the biggest question. I, it's also a compliment. I get this too, and it bothers me a little bit. People say, oh, we love watching your show, Jeff, because you show us how to do it the right way. So tonight, I'm going to tackle the concept of the right way. Be hopeful. I hope you're ready for this. This is going to be different. Um, first thing I wanted to say about the right way. There is no, read my lips, no such thing as the right way. Let's all take a moment to absorb. Whew. Yeah, that's right. You heard me say it, okay? Um, there are a lot of ways to do just about everything. There's a lot of different qualities, a lot of different standards. And the secret is not to know or to try to make it the best or the right way or reach for some kind of Mount Olympus godlike renovation quality. The secret in life is to identify the value of the renovation that you should be putting into your home, all right? And then gearing your budget and everything towards getting a proper installation of a good investment budget framework for where you live in your home for resale. That's really the goal. And there are a lot of different products and a lot of different installations and a lot of different uh, right ways to do something. So tonight I'm going to tackle all that information because as a consumer, I mean, you guys are bombarded with, with marketing and lies and half-truths and twisted language. And 
it's really difficult to navigate. You know, I mean, especially in the world of social media. Have you noticed there aren't too many Instagram stars out there who take pictures every day in their kitchen unless it's a designer kitchen that costs almost a half million dollars? Like, where's all the normal people taking pictures of their normal kitchen? <laughs> How come they don't become big successes? We've, we've, we've transformed the standard of what we think is normal to something that's not achievable by most people. And so I think that's a real big disservice. So today we're going to get practical again. I'm going to tackle a bunch of information here to help you navigate and make practical decisions because there is no shame and there's no guilt in being practical. All right. All that means is there's money left over when we're finally allowed to travel again to take your family and explore the world. I know lots of people who have, I've been in lots of these homes, right? <laughs> Raise your hand if you saw our video about the laundry room. And it was like this godsend of a laundry room. It was a massive room. We put herringbone tile, like beautiful backsplash. It was ridiculous, right? That laundry room renovation on our other channel, Reality Renovision. Uh -huh. Make sure you check it out if you don't know what I'm talking about. In that home, these folks had an amazing kitchen. It was gorgeous. Designer, Instagram worthy, HGTV worthy. It was a beautiful home. The funny thing is, is the people that lived in that home didn't know how to cook. <laughs> That's like owning a Ferrari and not being tall enough to reach the pedals. Like, what the heck is that all about? Oh, anyway. Oh, Daisy just sent us a super chat to say thank you. Thank you, Daisy. We do appreciate that love. My goodness. So listen, um, I'm going to deal with the first practical piece of information for you. There is no such thing as the right way to do things because no one's built the house to stand the test of time yet. Okay, ask the Egyptians. Hasn't worked for them, right? Those big pyramids are in rough shape. They don't look at anything like they did when they first got. They're like the dog on the street. Think about it. I know we get a lot of comments about uh, a lot of Europeans um, have an opinion about the fact that uh, construction over in Europe largely is more block, more cement, more stone wall. And they think that our construction technique with our lumber and our two by fours and our OSB and our plywood, they, they think a lot of that is just kind of funny, right? How in the world can you guys build like that? That's crazy. You should be using stone. Maybe. But the fact is that we can build a house three times faster this way. And since the whole world's trying to move to North America, it becomes a necessity for us to build quick. Now, our engineers go out there and they try to build something that's going to guarantee to last 50 years. Hello, Carolyn. Whoop. Nope. Oh, I should have brought my reading glasses. I know I bought glasses. All right. We got a super chat here. Oh, $20 super chat. They said I saved them way more than 20 bucks. I hope so. Like, honestly, the goal of my channel, if you're doing a major renovation and I can't save you at least a thousand bucks, I haven't done my job. Right. But let's get back to the point. Guys, engineers build for 50 years. That's their stamp. They put their name on something that it'll last 50 years. So when you buy a house that's brand new, it starts going up and up and up in value over time. If you live in a neighborhood where values are appreciating, right? Not every neighborhood has that. But if you're in a place like I am in Ottawa, we have a government economy here. Everybody works for the government. So we have pretty steady growth. They get to a point where the age of the home really needs a lot of work. And so even though it's still in Ottawa, it, it, it plateaus a little bit. It starts to maybe lose a little bit of value unless you renovate it and you reposition the value of the home. But I'm going to guarantee you, if you come back to Ottawa in 400 years, <laughs> all these homes that are selling for a million dollars right now are going to be junk. Nothing we're building is built to last two, three, 400 years. It just isn't happening. And I'm just being brutally honest about it. We are building a society that is not designed to be around forever. And that's fine. Personally, I don't think we're going to be around forever anyway. So I'm not concerned about it. But realize when you're thinking about a house and valuation and, and what's right for you, you've got to understand your neighborhood and your home and your age and all these other factors. We'll get into all that. But first, let's talk about the lens of judgment. Bum, bum, bum. All the different things that we do that relate to quality and how we, we decide if it's the right way. First of all, we have minimum building codes. Unless you're in Alaska, there is no code. 
You can build whatever the hell you want. Just don't die. It's cold. It's really cold. So they took away building code up there for a reason. They wanted to encourage people to move there and build whatever shanty they could figure out. And so they're a little bit more relaxed. But in a lot of places, minimum building code is very standard. And they're, they look a lot alike. Uh, regions have got different things going on. Temperatures, uh, rainfall, uh, uh, disaster, uh, you know, susceptibility is different. So they have different codes. Like we don't have much in our area for tornado code. So we don't strap our roofs to our walls and that sort of thing, but in some places you do. So let's just remember, building code is important, but it is a minimum code, right? There is something also called the grandfather clause. This is also right. It's nothing wrong with buying a really old house, not touching something, and it's acceptable. Like a set of stairs that's like this, you know, like a three inch tread and a 14 inch rise. If your house has got a death trap set of stairs and you don't touch it, it's still the right way to build it if you leave it alone. It's called the grandfather clause. All right. It applies to just about anything in construction. So it's something to consider. You might have a really old house and some of the things are a little bit screwy and wonky, but it's still the right way to build it if you leave it alone. Okay, I know that some of you are just going, what the heck is he talking about? We also have professional organizations and they have their own standards, okay? Like tile guys, great example. They have their own standards in the industry. It's way above minimum code, right? Like the minimum code for tile installation is disgusting. I'm not going to get into it today, but the point is the standards set by the tile industries are much higher than by construction and building agencies. I think Ontario is probably one of the worst regions for this because we don't have a lot of code, a lot of standards, and a lot of organizations that you've got to hire professionals. You can pretty much scrounge through the couch, find 60 bucks and start a business and be a contractor tomorrow in this province. It's a little bit wild west. And as a result, we get all kinds of varying qualities of contractors that are out there. And it's all very much based on their own individual ability to perform the job. They've never been trained. They've never been tested. They've never been approved. They're not getting updates. They don't have a standard. It's a bit of a wild west. But most places in the world, especially in, yeah, not North America, like the West Coast, for whatever reason, West Coast have got really, really good standards. Lots of standards, lots of organizations, lots of rules, almost to the point where it's like, you know, maybe you could back off just a little bit, but... We also have engineer stamps, okay? If you want to build something, you want to be creative, and you want to solve a problem, you can do it the right way, build anything you bloody well want, and have an engineer come and look at it and stamp your work. That is also right, okay? So it's an interesting concept, but you can solve a problem in conjunction with working with an engineer on site completely creatively. All right, and that's also a right way as long as the engineer approves the work, okay? Now, we also have lots of advanced technologies and, and you're gonna see a lot of this in um, uh, bathrooms especially, okay? Let's face it, bathrooms are where we need the most help, advanced technologies. And so you've got a, a basic build, you've got uh, tile work, you've got waterproofing systems, you've got advanced shower systems, all these advanced technologies, right? And then you've got best practices. Now, there are some people out there. There's one guy, uh, Matt Risinger, is on YouTube. He talks best practices all the time. He's always pushing the envelope as far as the latest, greatest technology, latest, greatest assemblies, okay, which is fancy word for the entire assembly or the entire process of building something like your outside wall assembly or the bathroom waterproofing assembly because the let's just let's do this. The more complicated you're, you're building something, the greater the chance of failure, right? Because people screw up. So if, you're, if your system for waterproofing is a panel and a bead of silicone, that's simple. May not be the best system, but it's simple. If you have this cloth and that panel and this cloth and this corner and this cement and that cement and 
and this engagement, and then this is how you put that, and you have to seal, and you, a certain time you have to let it sit and cure, and 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 and, and, and then you have a lot of opportunity for failure there because you are really relying on the integrity of the installer, right? So here's another example of how do you do it right? You got Schluter and you got Weedy. Those are both shower systems. They're both advanced technology. They both have an incredible ability to be an absolute disaster. They're extremely expensive. And if you don't do it right, you can be doing it right and still have a failure. And it's tricky, right? So as a homeowner, you're like, where in the world do I go? How do I decide what to do what? So I'm going to break this down real quick. Basements, okay? People ask me all the time, what's the best way to do a basement? The answer is there is no right way to renovate a basement. No right way to finish it. Basements break down into a couple of different questions. So if you are asking a question about a basement, I want you to break it down into this. What's the age of the house? Because technology's changed in the way that we poured concrete, foundations, insulation, vapor barrier, all of that stuff, weeping tile, drainage, all the rules changed over the life cycle of the last 100 years. So if you tell me the age of a home, then we'll understand the technology your home was built with and be able to help formulate an answer. Tell me the region you live in because everybody has different weather and freezing points and frost lines and um, uh, wind issues, okay, and ground slope issues. Soil conditions are a big issue when you're dealing with basements. What's your intended purpose of the basement? This is a big one because just because you've got a basement doesn't mean it's got to be a theater room with a second deck and then a full Irish pub. Sometimes it's just, I just need a clean finished room. I can throw a TV and let the kids crawl around the ground and, and be animals, right? If you got kids, you know, sometimes they just need to be animals. And if that's all you need, then there is a different approach to doing it right for that situation than there is if you want a formal entertaining space, right? And finally, what is the value of the home? And we'll get into that sooner. We're going to talk about how to decide how much money to invest in that part of your house, because there is a, a proper way to approach the right way to build something that involves your budget. All right. Now, with bathrooms, you've got your basic bathroom, semi-custom and custom. We're going to break it into three different areas there just to make life simple. A basic bathroom has basic systems and basic components that install really easily, okay, and don't generally fail. The more complex you get in the semi and the custom, again, the more complex the system, the assembly, how to connect Schluter's products with your tile products, with your cabinet products, with there's a lot of different things going on there. And I know lots of people who want to use a Schluter wall panel system around their tub, but then they ignore the floor. Like, well, are you going to make a Schluter bathroom or not? Do you need a waterproof? Is it necessary? Is it right? <laughs> You've got to take a look at the valuation of your home. Okay? How much use it gets. How long you plan on living here? How much use you're going to put in it, right? And then the age of the home and the how long you need it to last affects the scope of work. Because the more modern the system that you're installing, the more that system's designed for modern building materials as well. So an older home, for instance, that has dimensional lumber, like two by 10 floor joists that tend to do this. If you want to put a tile product on this, you've got a lot of prep work to do to make that floor flat and strong enough to prep it for tile. And so that's why I'm saying the more complex the system, the more prep work, the bigger the scope of work, the more chance of failure, the more money you have to throw in it in both directions, both in prep and in installation. You've got to make sure that your house can retain the value after that's all done, that it made financial sense. Because if you put a $100,000 bathroom in a $100,000 home and someone says, that's the right way to build a bathroom, they're an idiot because you're only going to make your house worth 110,000 bucks. It's just because of where you live. So we got to make sure that we're being smart when we're doing something the right way. All right. Kitchens, remodel versus renovation. That's a huge issue, right? You can do the remodel right or you can do a renovation right. And they're two distinct different processes. One involves moving mechanical and redesigning the layout. 
one doesn't, a lot of people who watch our channel should be in the remodel phase. They should be in the remodel camp, avoid trying to create an Instagram kitchen when you would be incredibly happy with just a brand new functional space that was relatively simple and straightforward to install, right? Now, how to choose. Then I'm gonna get into your questions. How to choose. I have a secret formula that I use when I'm working with someone to uh, determine a budget, right? Because, well, there's a little bit more information I'll get to in a second. When you're determining your budget, which is really a big issue, if you don't determine a budget and you're open-ended, uh, you're already lost. It's like being lost in the forest. You're just walking in circles, right? There's no end to a renovation without a budget, without a plan. If you have a plan, you have a budget. So they work together. Always know the end from the beginning, okay? It reduces a lot of stress, gives you a much more realistic timeline, and is a lot more fun to be a part of. Look at all this chat. My goodness. We have another member who joined the club here. That's awesome. Guys, here's my formula. You take the value of your house. All right? And then if you want to renovate your kitchen, I want you to understand this. Your kitchen is worth 20% of the value of your house. All right? When you're renovating, you've got to have a budget no more than 20% of your house. Now, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying you shouldn't. If it's a forever home, you've got to throw all the rules out the window, okay, and just do what you want to do. But remember this. Your kitchen should be 20%. That's a great real guide. Because uh, let's take a, an average bungalow in Florida, $200,000, right? Three-bedroom, kitchen, uh, ensuite bath, main bath, sliding door, bugs. That's how it works, right? So. 200,000 bucks, that means 40,000 for a kitchen. The average home in Florida, if you go over 40,000 in your kitchen, you're throwing your money away. What if your house is worth 100,000? Well, then you only got 20,000 for that kitchen. So maybe you take a look at painting the cabinets or go buy some reclaimed cabinets or buy um, uh, RTA, right? Go get something that's a knockdown or an Ikea. Right? Or go more open concept and don't put upper cabinets. There's workarounds for every financial situation, but make sure that you're sticking in a budget. Now, bathrooms. Bathrooms are 5%. Unless it's the ensuite, then you can push to 10%. You can even push closer to 20 if you live in a neighborhood with higher valuations and the master bathroom is a big issue. Okay? So, it'll, again, this is maybe you need to talk to a real estate agent to sort some of this out. But if you use that as a guide, as a homeowner hiring a contractor, those are the numbers that you should stick with. And I say that because if you're a homeowner and you're going to DIY something, <laughs> do you know how much kitchen you get for 40000 bucks if you're going to build it yourself? Oh my God. Now, if it's a forever home and you're going to DIY it and you want to put in a $40,000 worth of material, then go ahead. Enjoy it. Live la vida noche. But if you are a homeowner and you're looking for an investment situation and you're only going to be there maybe five years and you're going to renovate your house and you're going to do a bathroom or a kitchen on your own, going to 40 grand because you can and the house can absorb that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Maybe cut back and try to say we can do this for 10 or 8 or 12 you know, have a little bit of fun, but generally with a contractor, materials come in at 25% of the cost of a project. So if you do that, you're down in the 10,000 range. See if you can map out a plan to make a really nice kitchen for 10,000 bucks. If you can stick to it, that's a good investment. Now, uh, <laughs> still love you, Jeff, but no way. What are we talking about? Granite, everything. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Okay, here we go. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, the other thing we want to know about is flooring as a DIYer. Uh, if you want to do flooring as a DIYer, you're going to find that almost all the flooring that's out there that's of quality is within the same couple dollars a square foot range. From luxury vinyl to luxury laminate to porcelain tile to hardwood and engineered wood, it's all within the same couple of bucks a square foot. Now, if you have a 2,000 square foot home, and you're going to put all brand new flooring in. 
and it's going to be gorgeous. And you're confident you can do a good quality install. Then you pick the best flooring for your house and for your market. Okay. Don't be afraid to talk to a real estate agent. If you're in Florida, it's going to be a gorgeous porcelain. If you're in the Northwest, then you're probably going to want to go hardwood. If you're out in California, it's definitely going to be something like this big by this big with a Schluter membrane. All right. <laughs> oh. Mm. Now, other issues here with picking out what's the right way to do something. Because it's got to be for you. It's not what's right for somebody else. It's not what's right for HGTV. It's not right for Mike Holmes. It's what's right for you. Yeah, I said it. All right. Ha <laughs> um, How do we choose budget materials for us? Okay. First of all, remodel or re renovate. Are you giving a facelift to an existing space or are you changing all the mechanical and locations and everything else? That's a renovation. Different beast. Renovating a house requires two things. A, it's got to be uh, antiquated systems that actually run the risk of failure and destroying your home. Don't just start moving things around for the hell of it. If it's a brand new house. You don't move the kitchen to where the living room is and vice versa. That doesn't make any sense. Okay? Just don't buy a house if you're like that. Go buy something old if you want to renovate. Uh, but remodeling, you can remodel anything that's brand new because a lot of times the brand new stuff they're putting in houses is garbage anyway. And you can do a much nicer job and get a better result if you want to DIY it. But location is a big issue. What's right for you depends on location, okay? Um, if you're in Laurel, Mississippi, I think that's the, I think it's Laurel, Mississippi. That new TV show, HGTV, is a real cute couple. Guy's a woodworker and the wife is a designer. They do some really cute stuff down there. They're fixing up an old neighborhood. The valuations of the homes down there are brutally low, right? Now, once you've renovated it and bring it all back to life, they're still not all that exciting. They're taking a house they're buying for $30,000, putting in $70,000 worth of work, and they get a house that's worth $100,000. They're glad to break even. <laughs> Up here, the average home, the average single family home in Ottawa right now is selling for over $650,000. I don't know what the hell's going on. It's crazy. But the point is, it's also Canadian money, so it really only means five hundred. dollars but the point is this, your location has everything to do with your value. Because if you drive a few hours east out into the Maritimes in New Brunswick, you can get a single family home for 40 or 50. Like, it's just absolutely amazing. It all depends. Where do people want to live? Personally, I think there should be a trend. There's a cute little town called Ogdensburg, New York, just on the other side of the river, outside of Ottawa. And they're a little stalled out, older, kind of smaller community. If they would bring fiber optic high speed to their city, I bet half of the people living downtown Manhattan would move out there to work from home because you can buy a four bedroom home on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Yeah, for a hundred thousand bucks. Who wouldn't want that deal? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at it myself. All right, secondly, timeline, right? Flipper forever home, two different deals. If you're gonna renovate a bathroom, and you have a 10 year plan. You make sure that the bathroom you renovate today is gonna to be stellar in 10 years. Don't go cheap out now, because you'll end up renovating again, and then your cycle will never end, okay? You make sure that you have a plan for the 10 year plan so that every area of your home is brought to the same degree of quality, all right? And the same degree of done right, so that when you go to sell your house, you don't have a disappointing room somewhere. But we started here, and that's why this bathroom looks ugly. Uh, you know, you don't want that. Um, uh, okay. Here. Yeah. If you want to do something right, you have to decide if you're budget or design driven. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Somebody's asked a question before I'm done. That's fine. I'll answer it. I'm close. Can I install engineered hardwood that is the same thickness of traditional hardwood flooring on second floor townhome with three quarter inch concrete on the floor. Oh yeah, sure. So you're basically asking if you can en install engineered hardwood on concrete. And if the answer of course is yes. As long as the concrete is dry. If it's on the second floor, it's dry. It doesn't have contact with organics. You won't have moisture coming through it all the time. You can just put down your adhesive and apply it. You'll be fine. 
Um, same thing holds true if you are slab on grade, as long as your slab on grade has got a vapor barrier and you can put down an adhesive and apply uh, engine hardwood right on top of that, no problem. It's done all the time. And the way that you test that actually is by taking the garbage bag and taping it with tuck tape, okay? Tape it to the concrete, leave it overnight. Come back the next day, lift it up. If there's a wet spot, you probably shouldn't be installing hardwood on that floor. All right, now, I know for a fact that the whole world is trying to tell you that their product is the right way to do it, that their system is the best system, that uh, this needs to be done this way, this needs to be done this way. You're tossed and turned. Understand this. On this channel, I understand that there are different people living in different places, making different amounts of money with different house valuations with different goals. We are not going to force feed you best practices and make everything unaffordable. Okay. This year, we actually have plans. Don't want to let the cat out of the bag too early, but we're looking to acquire a property. And that property is going to be an awesome opportunity for us to show you a lot of different ways to renovate the same thing. Okay. So we're going to show you um, uh, some very budget conscious, efficient ways to build a bathroom. And we're going to show you everything in between. I'm going to, I want to go through the marketplace and see what's out there. Um, there's U-Tile, there's pre-done boards and panel systems and caulking only. There's a lot of different products on the market that I haven't worked with because generally, if you know how to tile, you don't ever leave. <laughs> you don't leave tile if you know how to tile. But if you're one of these folks who just doesn't want to learn how to tile or it intimidates you for any reason, which it shouldn't, then we are going to take a look at some of these other alternatives that can be quick, cheap, and simple, including um, there's, a, there's a painting system you can put on your tub and your tile. All you do is remove the silicone, you can paint the whole thing, add your new silicone, and you're good for another five years. Now, that may not sound exciting to some people, and a lot of people say that's not the right way to do it. But if you ask the guy that's doing the paint job, is this the right way to paint tubs and tile to get five-year performance, he'd say, that's the right way to paint the tub and tile. So it would be the right way. It's just about your budget, your expectations, right? And everybody's in a different place in life. And so there's no judgment there. We want to be there to help you navigate that. So I'm going to open up the comment section now. I'm done jabbering. I can sit here and give you examples all night long of different jobs I've been on and all kinds of different ways to do things. But I want to hear from you. So if you got a question, fire it up. If you want to make sure that I'm going to answer it, then send it in a super chat. Okay. That's the easiest way to do it. I don't know. I'm making these rules up as I go along, but uh, we're going to see what we can do here. Here we go. I'm jumping in. Okay. So Kyle says he's installing luxury vinyl plank on concrete, slab on grade. Manufacturer insists we don't use underlayment. However, you did in the episode a while ago where you insisted it is necessary. Ha, ha, ha. This is a great question. Kyle, way to open it up, buddy. Right, one sec. Daddy needs a little ginger ale. So um, here's the thing. I'll take this example, okay? Life-proof flooring from Home Depot. It's a decent quality floor, right? And they say, don't use an underpad. What did they come out with about three weeks ago for life-proof? Anyone comment? Yeah, an underpad for life-proof. Do you know why? Because people were having horrible installation results without using the underpad. Because the dirt that was stuck underneath the floor was causing bumps and translating through the top of the surface. So when you look down the hall, you see these bumps showing up like measles on your floor. They get on the phone and say, yo, Home Depot, you told me not to use an underpad. What the hell, man? So they have got so much backlash, they've added underpad. Now, I'm sorry, it's expensive. It now makes their vinyl flooring product unaffordable. <laughs> it's almost a bucket square foot. The reason people don't want you using an underpad, I really don't know. I don't think there is an answer to that question. They're concerned with you using the wrong underpad for the product. Okay, I think is what it is. Because there are underpads out there that are actually quite soft. Like if you got that white bubble crap in between the plastic from they sell at Home Depot and you put that under life proof, you run the risk of stepping on a crack and busting it open. If you buy the stuff I'm talking about, you don't run that risk. But 
you really got to decide as a consumer when you're going to buy something, who are you going to listen to? The largest retailer in the world who's selling everything that they want to sell you based on how much profit margin they can make or someone who's actually installed tens of thousands of square feet of flooring is like, the question, <laughs> I'm just being tongue in cheek. Kyle, when it comes down to this, um, common sense always prevails. If you think that you want to have the warranty in place from somebody, okay, versus doing something that's outside of the warranty that you're more comfortable doing, that's your gamble. I know I'm taking a chance where I'm suggesting using underpad, but if you're telling me you want the warranty or you don't want to void a warranty, then don't buy their vinyl. Buy vinyl that says oh, it's okay to use an underpad. Right? That's all there is to it. If a company doesn't put the time and energy and research into matching up an underpad with their product so they can ship it out with a warranty attached to it, they're going to say, don't use it. And they're going to leave you screwed. So if you, if you like the idea of having an underpad and slab on grave with an underpad, nothing wrong with that at all, all right? My God, go ahead and use it. If it was good enough for the laminate floor, it would be good enough for the vinyl floor as long as it was a high-quality, dense underpad, all right? I'm going to move on, but that is it. I don't want to balk too much of this, but folks, when it comes to warranty, I want you to understand. Most warranties that are on products and sold in a home hardware store that are installed by a homeowner amount to about 25 cents worth of protection for you. They don't really have any plans to back up the warranty. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's different than a car. If you buy a product and it says 10 year product, warranty, and you call them up at nine and a half years and say, you know what, this is starting to look pretty crappy. They'd be like, yeah, but it was just for average use. You obviously had too much use. We're not going to cover the warranty. They're going, to, they're going to come up with excuses all day long, and they can. Because if you look at the details of the warranty, they're really sketchy and scarce. They have no intention of actually following through on that warranty coverage. So don't get caught in the trap of being told what to do based on a warranty. All right? Because in a lot of cases, it means nothing. I was on a project once, and the company I was working for, this is many years ago back when Schluter was coming out. We installed their Schluter membrane and... Um, installed the tile and the tile failed. It turns out that the mortar that the, the company was using wasn't really compatible with the membrane, even though it was a, a non-modified. It was just a cheap version. And so they sent up the regional sales rep. We went through all this rigmarole. They, we peeled the floor back. Oh, oh, there you go. Okay, yeah, you know what? Maybe... Maybe it's our fault. We'll cover the cost of our product. Mm -hmm. Anybody out there who knows what it means to do a custom tile job and to remove it and reinstall it, that's, we're talking, uh, I think the cost of removal and reinstall and supplying all the new products was around 8000 And Schluter rep was willing to pitch in a few hundred bucks for some membrane. That was the extent of the warranty. It was for their product only, not the job itself. So this is why I'm saying the more complex the system, the more opportunities there are for everybody in that system to just walk away and say, yeah, I'll give you 50 bucks towards your problem. If the warranties really aren't worth the paper that they're written on. I'd rather use paper on a roll in the bathroom. Anyway, I'm going to zip down. I got to catch up with the questions. Uh, Lewis wants to install a vault door. You mean like a bank vault, Lewis? <laughs> well, that's freaking me out. Uh, hey, Alex, cheers, buddy. Appreciate that. Only Alex. That's an interesting handle you got there, dude. Um, Richard wants to know, he needs. does he need to run a supply vent for heat and cooling to his crawl space if I'm encapsulating it? First of all, crawl spaces are a part of the house. They're on the interior of the home. And if you're going to insulate and put in a vapor barrier, then yes, you've got to heat and cool it like any other part of the house, okay? Or whatever's adjacent to it is going to get insufficient heating and cooling. You're going to end up with condensation issues, and you're going to end up with 
uncomfortable living conditions right above the crawl space. It's going to be inconsistent. So like, let's say you've got a living room and then a dining room and the living room's over a crawl space and the dining room isn't because it's an extension off the home or something like that. But you've got all hardwood all the way across, right? Beautiful, open concepts. Nice, right? But then your dining room's got good heating, but then the living room doesn't. Now your expansion and contraction in those two floors is different, okay? That's where you really run into trouble. So if you're going to encapsulate it, then make sure you add the heating or cooling. It's a really simple system. It doesn't take a lot of energy or time and money. And it'll protect the investment of whatever it is that you've got going on above it. Again, if you're just going with vinyl flooring, eh, caution to the wind. You know, maybe not have to worry about it. But something like hardwood flooring is very susceptible, tile susceptible to expansion contraction. You've got to combine these systems, right? So if you're going to encapsulate, now you've got a thermal break. As soon as you've got a thermal break, you've got to balance humidity. You've got to balance temperature because that affects expansion and contraction at different rates. And that's your enemy. So it's good advice to just uh, try to keep everything working together harmoniously in your system as much as you can. Got an interesting question here. I got a 1974 home with popcorn ceiling. Got some areas where it fell off. No kidding. Estimate for asbestos abatement is $31,000 for a 1,200 square foot house. Can I DIY with PPE or cover with beadboard? Okay. So the unofficial answer is yes. Just don't tell anybody what you're doing. <laughs> Um, the other answer is you can install a new ceiling over the old one. Okay. Get yourself a drywall panel lift machine, the little yellow machine with a crank. All right. Put your drywall on there. Trowel in some mud, drywall compound, raise it up, screw it into the existing ceiling using either laminating screws. And we're going to have to do a video on this because this system needs to be done. But Asbestos is only dangerous when you touch it, when you disturb it. We use the same rule of thumb with uh, asbestos tiles. Those nine by nine vinyl tiles that are on concrete in a lot of basements. Uh, people are like, oh, that's ugly. It's not, I'm going to chip it out. And they're chipping. And when you chip, the fibers are released in the air. Those are really dangerous fibers. The same thing goes with the ceiling. It, we, we, are, we are allowed. It's the right way to cover asbestos tile with any other kind of flooring and leave it alone. You can cover over all your existing ceilings the right way and leave it alone. Then you just take the joints, or maybe do some crown molding or, or do, do the outside joints if you like, paint the house. For $31,000, I could put all brand new ceilings in your 1200 square foot home, crown molding in every room and give you a, a brand new paint job and still send you to Europe for a couple of weeks. I'm telling you right now. That's an insane amount of money for something that you can cover up the right way just by putting a new layer of drywall over top. All right. I hope that helps you, Dora. 1992. Um, yeah. It, it, asbestos is not, it's not like, uh, it's not C4. It doesn't explode, right? It's only toxic when it's disturbed and the fibers go airborne. So if you cover them up, it's a perfectly safe way to address it. And that'll save your bacon. All right. Um, <laughs> off topic. Somebody just wants to let me know they subscribe because they think I'm handsome. Well, you know, the truth is, is uh, you're right. My wife agrees with you. All right. Um, someone wants to know about their Jeep. I know nothing about cars. I know how to get in them and drive them. That's it. So uh, you, you, maybe if you call, contact Max. Max has a Jeep. Max is really good with vehicles. You can weld and stuff too. It's kind of funny. All right. Let me just go down here a little bit. Um, whoa, say someone wants to know what I think about CGC, sheetrock, dust control, drywall. Oh, I hate that stuff. I'm sorry, CGC. And you know, here's another the right way, right? Here's the product that was designed to solve a problem. It's for homeowners who are doing home repairs who are lousy tapers and mutters. Okay, like I'm just making it sure you understand. This product was made for people who do lousy mud work and then are going to sand it and don't want to make a mess of their house. 
The mud work is so bad, they have to sand so much to make it smooth that they'd be lost in a cloud of dust, right? It'd be like being in some inside of a silo at some manufacturing plant somewhere and there's just dust over. If you want to avoid that, you buy that compound because it falls straight to the floor. The problem with this compound is it leaves a real crap look on the wall. It has like little mini molecules of like almost like a wax substance in it. Okay, so the wall is pitted. It's never smooth. And so I personally can't stand this stuff. I would rather spend a little bit of time buying the right tools and learning how to use them than ever touch that mud. I work with a guy, one guy once and he swore by it. He used it all the time. And every time he was finished the job and painted the walls, you could see the little pinholes in it everywhere. It always looked like junk. I just hated it. Wow. Uh, when renovating a bathroom, should I start with the shower or finish with the shower? Okay. When renovating a bathroom, do all the demo, do all the plumbing, do all the electrical, close up all the walls, then do all the tiling, then put in all the fixtures, and then do all the painting. Or you can even paint first and then do all the fixtures. But don't do one part of the bathroom at a time. I don't think I quite understand your, maybe the question isn't really getting translating well with me. Maybe I need a little more ginger ale. Nope, that didn't fix it. All right. Sorry there, bud. I'm not sure. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I mean, it's nice to always have a toilet working. I'm a big believer in if you only have one bathroom in your house, at the end of the day, install the toilet over and over and over and over again. I think that's uh, money well spent. <laughs> you go through a few wax rings over a couple of weeks, but it is nice to have a bathroom working. You never know. Sometimes you just got to go. All right. Uh, what percent of a home should be put towards a two-car detached garage? It's very specific. You have one that needs to be demolished, yeah. All right. Big tips. Okay, so uh, at, at the end of the day, if you have a two-car detached garage, the cost of building that garage is the cost of building that garage. It's basic building materials. It's lumber. It's OSB. It's some kind of siding. and It's some kind of roofing. I would suggest that you maybe contact your real estate agent and say, what's the valuation of a house without a garage versus one with a garage? That'll give you a good budget to work with. And then see if you can line that up somehow. I don't know. All right. That's really probably the best advice I got because, again, all these questions depend on location, the economy of the region. Um, and, and a few other things like that. And is it still got a good foundation that you can build on? A lot of times if a detached garage is falling apart, it's because maybe it was built back before they poured really good concrete foundations, you know, before rebar, before they knew about soil conditions. And so the, the, the floor is like this now. And so everything's falling apart. Yeah, that's tough. I wouldn't say there's a percentage. But if you follow that advice, you should get a really good idea of what the value of having a new one is versus, and then you can have it costed out and find out, you know, if it's something that you can pay someone to do because you're breaking even, or if it's worth learning a few skills and DIYing it and making some money. I'm a big fan of DIY. That's why I do the channel. But I understand. Not everybody wants to build everything, right? Uh, we do have a new shed video coming up that is rather large. That is almost big enough to be a garage that could easily be converted into garage video, just needs different doors and maybe a different dimension. It's kind of more of a workshop for me, but um, I'm sure you'll be able to learn a lot from that if that is needed. Next. It is now 10 to seven. Do you know where your children are? Uh, hey, I'm thinking of starting my own business and renovating. And I'm going to be installing crown molding. And what's the difference between coping and mitering? Wow. I am going to suggest that if you are serious about wanting to get into the finished carpentry business, that you spend more time watching videos from a finished carpenter. There is a guy, um, I think he's in Texas. Uh, it's Carpentry TV. Okay. Now he's on YouTube. Now he has some great skills and, and, and talents, and he teaches a lot of tips and tricks, and he shows a lot of techniques. So if that's your thing, go check him out, Carpentry TV on YouTube. 
Uh, cheers. He does great work. And uh, I'm sure you'll learn a lot. My advice would be if you want to get into business and you're not sure on some of the building techniques that are specific to that trade, best to go get a job working for someone who's in that trade, who's a qualified, competent craftsman first and glean and learn from them. There's enough to learn about business without having to learn the trade at the same time. And you don't want to be one of these guys that's making people upset because you don't know what you're doing. All right. Can't make a living if you can't build the building. Right. I mean, that's just how it is. Uh, we got a contractor from Michigan here. Cheers, Riley. Uh, nothing wrong with being a contractor. I wish we could all get a little more respect like doctors. Because at the end of the day, doctors are practicing their trade. And we know our trade. Just say. All right. Can we make a video and or talk about drill bits you use? Yeah, I use round ones that make holes. Um, yeah, probably. One of these days I'll get around to it. Around to it. Right? <laughs> well, we'll see. That's not a bad idea, actually. I am planning on doing uh, videos every Tuesday. Live shows for the next, like, foreseeable future. Just because, um, well, let's be honest, we're renovating our house and Max is going to be having a baby soon. So we are trying to create some extra inventory for the channel. So we have videos for you every Saturday night like normal. And I thought, what a great way to do our two videos a week is if I just did a live show and then I can, because like, really, when we shoot a video, a lot of these videos that we do for Tuesday, like our bench video series and stuff, I literally just set up the bench, put some stuff on it, talk about it. Max films it, edits it. You know, it's just extra work for nothing. I might as well just do it live. It'd be a little bit more fun. All right. Let's see what we got here. We are, uh, what's the cleanest transition from hardwood to tile that's three-eighths higher? Schluter. When you tile, buy the metal Schluter tile that goes under the tile, straight up, and then has a slant on it. Okay. And it's not a full return, it's just a partial return. And that'll come butt right up to the top of your hardwood and give you that extra three eighths that you're looking for. Cheers, works every time. All right, uh, if I wanted, hoo, 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 lost my question. See, I used the mouse and then moved. Oh. Can I please go on Modern Craftsman podcast? You would love it. Huh. All right, I'm gonna write that down. Modern Craftsman. Yeah, because, you know, like everybody who watches our show, I've bragged about, well, announced maybe is a better word. We're going to end up doing a podcast. We've got plans coming up really soon. The only issue with us doing a podcast right now is my podcast um, producer is, is going through some health concerns. And so until that's all out of the way, we're not going to start. All right. So uh, that's just life. It's not always wonderful and fair and straight. Sometimes the road has a few curves in it. That's okay. We will get there eventually, folks. Um, Gene Medley. Gene, that is a very generous donation. You're adorable. Can I do a video to add a landing on an exit to enter right instead of left? Currently have no mid-stair landing now. If it's possible that, you know what? You're going to be in luck, Gene. The, pro, the project that we're looking to buy is going to have a lot of structural components like this. Staircases, adjustments, stairs, decks, railings, um, interior and exterior. So this modification that we're going to do to this place is going to be pretty extensive. I just can't speak much about it because we put the offer on. We're negotiating right now. So, you know, yeah. hopefully we can make the announcement sooner than later. But yeah, Gene, I would love to do something like that. I know a lot of times you guys ask us questions. Can we do a video on something? And sometimes you're in the middle of the project and the answer is, no, I can't do it that quick. But, um, you know, if, if I can, can make a video and you've got a suggestion, like now that you've got that burned in my brain, Gene, I think definitely we'll do some stair videos next year. Um, as long as this project goes through. <laughs> okay, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But uh, thanks for the idea, and thank you for the super chat. That was really sweet. All right. Um, hi, Jeff. One of my bedrooms don't get enough heat and slash cool. Yeah, no kidding. How do I proceed to find the problem and fix it? 
1,200 square foot home. See, that's not even a very big house. Why are you having a heat issue? You know, a lot of times these houses, it all depends on your, your, your system, right? If you have central air, like if you have a basement with a central air and you have ducts, you have components, you have one pipe after another, after an elbow, after a pipe, and they all get screwed and taped together. But they didn't tape things together. They didn't do it the right way back in the day, right? They just stuck it together, threw in a couple of screws. And a lot of times during the installation, um, one of those joints can break open. And your efficiency goes from, if you have two elbows, you lose 5% in elbow, okay? So your efficiency goes from 90% of air flowing through that pipe. You're going to break your down to like 30 because it's not just the break. It's the turbulence caused by the break and the air blown in all these different directions. If you have ductwork, you can have it inspected. They can put a camera in there and follow it and find out if there's a break in a, in a finished ceiling or in a wall somewhere. That's one way you can solve that problem. The other way is you can call an HVAC guy and they can do an audit on your system and find out why you're having an issue, okay? I've seen things like um, people have put on uh, uh, like a side takeoff, okay? And, and run a, a, a line, but they were busy on the phone when they were doing it. They got distracted. They forgot to cut a hole in the side of the, the bloody <laughs> duckwork. So there's no air moving through the pipe. Sometimes it can be that simple and stupid. And we all laugh about it and go, ha, ha, ha. But the truth is, things happen. Life is not wonderful. Um, but uh, putting an inspection camera inside a duct line sometimes is the best way to determine what's going on. They do it for plumbing all the time. No reason you can't do it for HVAC. Uh, do I ever do consults in Ottawa? No, sorry, Luke. My life is completely absorbed with YouTube and renovating my own house. I do not do anything else on the side. Sorry to say. I wish I did. People think some, you know, it's funny because half the people that watch our channel think I'm out here looking to find contracts, but I'm not even in the renovation business anymore. I renovate my own house now. That's it. I'm done with that. So, Everyone can maybe stop asking me the same question. Can you hire me? No, the answer is no. The minute I have more time in my schedule, I am going to give it away and help people who need help. All right? And that's what we're working towards, building a system where we can do that. Um, so T-Town T-shirts, <laughs> 10 bucks for a shameless plug. God, I love it. If I wanted to insulate slash drywall my detached garage... Would that help the value of the house later if I wanted to sell it? It would help me as I use it during the winters in Ohio. Okay, so here's the thing. A detached garage, if you insulate it and put drywall on the wall, it depends what your heat source is. If all you're doing is throwing in insulation, you got to have a heat source or there's no value to you. I would say anything that's got a finished wall has value, but you have to be really, really careful because there might be a building code that says as soon as you put a finish on the wall, you also have to have a certain amount of electrical plugs every so many feet. So make sure you check that out before you do it. Um, yeah, man, that's, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a master of house evaluations all over North America. Okay, I haven't done those studies. I've done a lot of reading. I understand there's a lot of variance, a lot of differences. I understand why there is, but I don't know what the numbers are in any region. So the best person to ask about that, again, is go ask your real estate agent because a real estate agent will know what the comparables are for finished heated insulated garages versus not. Okay, and there'll be a better way for them to, to guide you than I can be. Especially, where do you say you're in Ohio? There's a lot of different places in Ohio and they have a lot of different valuations. So again, same question, right? All right. Uh, what's the number one thing that's worth DIYing on a home that adds more value than what you put into it? Uh, painting, inside or outside. End of discussion. Um, doesn't matter. Nothing comes close. You, you, you increase the value of your home by 5% by painting the outside and 5% by painting the inside. You can do it yourself. You can learn it in 40 minutes on one of my videos and you can be better painter than half the professional painters that are on the market watching that video. I'll tell you right now. Um, without a doubt. Painting, 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 painting. Um, 
probably the biggest impact in the whole marketplace is actually an older house with wooden cabinets and painting the cabinets. That's got to be probably one of the biggest returns in the history of mankind. Okay, Roderick has a question. My house has no basement, so you can't do a lot of things that you show. Yeah, I get it. Hope to see content for some of the projects without basement and only crawl space. All right, so the only difference between basement and crawl space really is um, you don't have the problems associated with trying to finish a living space that was never designed to be finished. <laughs> so you're actually in better shape than everybody trying to finish a basement. Um, by the way, a lot of the videos that I do are in my old farmhouse, and I don't have a basement that I renovate either. So we did um, a video where we encapsulated the crawl space and created a heated space. But in a lot of houses, um, Roderick, I mean, there are there's a ton of places around North, North America that are just all on crawl space. And I don't use the word just lightly. I mean, it, it's a great system because what you get with a crawl space is you get a floor insulation, a covering, if there's insulation, if you're far enough south, they don't even insulate, but you get air flowing underneath. And that air is what stabilizes the humidity issues underneath the house. So it's actually a really nice way to balance out the conditions underneath the house that affect the structure and affect the expansion contraction of all the materials inside the home. It's really, really effective way of making things very stable and consistent over time. So anything to do with your house, um, if you're modifying plumbing and everything else, if you have an insulated crawl space, as far as the floor is concerned, then you treat it like uh, anything else in your house. You have to reinstate your insulation system, make sure you have a good thermal break, watch your vapor barrier technology, make sure you integrate that in the right place. If you're using it, I don't know. It's not always necessary. But everything we do on this channel, yes, it's not always applicable to every region. But there's always there's always something there that you can learn <laughs> that can be applied somewhere else. Um, I'm really looking forward, actually, to once this COVID mess is gone, we're, we're planning on actually driving around a lot of areas, getting down to the south and visiting members who've got these homes so we can do some tours and get the cameras in the crawl space, talk about the technology. And, and go take a look and see what people are building. So we do have plans down the road for this channel to get a little bit more grinder scope as far as geography is concerned. So uh, stick with us, buddy. We'll get down there sooner or, later. sooner or later. We'll be able to make something that'll be a lot more help to you. Um, yeah, oh yeah. So Kiana wants to know, is it better to blow in attic insulation or use the bats? Okay. Whenever you can blow it in, you get a much more efficient Insulation. Bat versus bat, there's always room for gaps. When you blow it in, you fill the space, you're always going to get the best result possible. As long as you don't cheap out and, and try to buy just the right amount of insulation for your space, because then you're going to be stuck with this integrity issue. When you get to the end, you're like, oh, there's just not enough for that corner. Well, close enough. But don't do that to yourself. Always buy too much. And when you take the machine back, take back material that you're not going to use anymore. Same time. That's the best thing. But blown in by far is a much better insulation system for addicts than bats. Uh, how far south am I coming, Sandy? I am coming so far south that you will be north. <laughs> I really am looking forward to getting into like southern Florida. I want to get out to Texas. Um, you know, and, and hopefully the year after we'll be able to get into maybe South America and we'll do some touring in Europe as well. I'm loving to check out what people are building around the world. Um, okay. Let's see. Can I remodel a washroom, tiles, vanity, and toilet without taking the tub apart? Yes, 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 yes. One of the greatest advantages you have as a homeowner with a tub is, and you know, every, every show you watch, they're always ripping the tub out. I'm even guilty of this. I have not done a, a video yet where we left the tub in place. Because generally, I was working for clients, and they always wanted a brand new tub, even though they had a perfectly good, legitimate tub. Listen, if you want to save a ton of money, and you have a tub, and it's in good condition, even if it's not in great condition, but the plumbing is still in great condition, the drains, the waste overflow works, you can 
have that tub professionally painted. It's called reglazing, and it's the right way to do it. All right, with a professional, don't get a kit off the shelf and paint it yourself. It's a waste of time and money. You'll be doing it every six months after you peel all the paint off again. But if you get it reglazed professionally, you're looking at five to 10 years with regular consistent use, okay, before it starts to get dull. And it's only a couple hundred bucks. You can leave the tub in place. You don't have to touch it. Just peel the walls off, put on new tile if you want to. But yeah, you can leave the tub alone. And for a lot of people, it makes a lot more sense to leave it there because, A, if you're DIYing, now you don't incur the risk of having a drain issue with the tub, which always ends up in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If I had a dollar for every time we had a leak in the ceiling after doing plumbing in someone's bathroom. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, they just don't make products like they used to. So if you buy an acrylic tub, the, the bottom of the tub surface isn't usually flat enough to really receive a gasket properly. We got to a point where we started making sure that we pulled out a a file and we would intentionally file and like magnifying glass inspect these things. Those acrylic tubs can be uh, really quite a handful. Uh, okay, so let me go down here. Uh, can I add a layer of roof insulation when I add a new roof when there is none now? Okay, so if you want to insulate your roof and you're going to peel off your roof and the decking, then you'll expose enough that you can get insulation in there. Yeah. If you can pick enough weather, good weather days that you want to peel your roof, peel one side so that, or even just a corner, like somewhere in the middle, pull off, uh, pull off enough that you could throw down a couple of sheets of plywood or maybe a tarp if you needed to, to protect the house against weather. But if you open up enough of a space that you can get in there with a blown in insulation pipe, and then like blow the whole attic full, my God, that'll save you a ton of money with heat and, and cooling costs. It's a great idea. You don't have to pull the whole roof off to do it either. Um, I would say from your position where you make your hole, you can blow insulation a good 12 to 15 feet confidently and get good result. So if you can go 15 feet in each direction, that's 30 feet, maybe two holes in the roof is enough to do the whole house. That's not a bad gig. Oh, Henri has just joined the Money in the Bank Club. Hey, cheers, man. Welcome to the club. Um, let's see. Obsessed with vintage. Super chat. Any tips on increasing the soundproofing of a window? Hmm. Yes. Let's keep this simple. Um, if you have a window, it's basically a hole in the wall. Now, if you have a regular house with OSB siding and drywall on the inside and there's insulation in the wall, your wall only has the capacity to be so quiet and you don't necessarily have to blame the window. It can be the wall as well. All right. But if you want to make your window quieter, then you can replace the window that's there with a window that does not have a function. Okay. It's just solid glass. You can't open it for fresh air. You can't crank it. All right. And that will reduce an amazing amount of sound. You foam the gap around the outside. And that is a great way to find out if that indeed is the problem with the noise in that wall or if it's part of the whole wall as a system. There, it's a very tricky thing. Soundproofing is not about soundproofing. It's about reducing the amount of sound to the point where it's not too irritating anymore. All right. And there's levels of that. So if you can change out the glass, a couple hundred bucks, you can buy yourself a window that doesn't have a function, install that, try that, okay? There's no air moving. One way you can test that is you can take a plastic film and you can two-sided tape and seal it up so the air stops transferring and then see if that makes much of a difference. If that is a dramatic improvement, then maybe it's a good time to invest in a new window. If it doesn't make a dramatic improvement, getting a new window probably isn't going to help. You might have to take a look at adding a new layer of 5 8 drywall on the entire wall. Check your electrical to see if it's sealed up properly. And there's a lot of different places where air can leak in through a wall and the sound will travel with air movement. All right, so if your house does not have a good air seal, you will have a noisy house no matter what you do with the window. The other option is uh, the soundproofing company where we work with Trademark Soundproofing. They do have a window application that has a sound absorption pad that actually hangs on hooks, covers the entire window, has a Velcro seal, and that is really effective for street noise, especially 
So you can check that one out as well. Uh, oh. Okay, so the best stud finder. <laughs> best do-it-yourself stud finder. Um, I'm going to go with go to your local building store, spend 10 or 12 bucks on something that takes a battery, right? You push the button, you slide it on the wall, and it beeps and changes the color. We use Zircon. That's what they're distributing up here. Um, there's more than one manufacturer. It's simple and it works, okay? And then when you've marked it, then the best way to confirm it is take like a drywall screw and install it right up until there's just enough there that you can put your hammer on it and see if you can pull that out, okay? A one and a quarter inch drywall screw should never penetrate the drywall deep enough to ever pierce plumbing or electrical or anything like that if it's at a stud. So it's a safe way to check it out. But that's my advice. All right. Uh, now let's see what we got here. It is 10 after seven. Cheers. Mm. Uh. So we got somebody here who just bought a 1908 commercial building. Oh, we're doing 4,000 square feet for our residents. Thoughts on radiant floor heating versus baseboard. Oh, if you're talking about electric heat, radiant floor heat can be water or, or electric, right? Um, it doesn't really matter as far as heating is concerned. Whatever heat energy you put into that house, it takes the same electricity to produce the heat. There's not one system's more efficient than the other. So in my opinion, I always go for in-floor heating, all right? Um, if you're doing a lot of square footage, I would even do this. Are you ready for this? You can put down an um, electric floor mat, right, that you can run your heating cable in, and you can install engineered hardwood over top. If it's a click lock system, you don't even need any fasteners, okay? No adhesive necessary. It's just drop, lock, and lay right on top of that, and you can have heated hardwood flooring. Blows your mind. I know. Go price it out. You'd be surprised. And you don't necessarily have to heat the entire floor, right? You can, you can change your spacing so that you have enough heating capacity to heat the space, and it's very consistent with the floor. The other thing is, is uh, engineered hardwood doesn't expand and contract the same as regular hardwood. So you're going to have heated zones and unheated zones, and it's not going to make a darn difference. That's worth, that's, and, and it's pretty. Like electric baseboards up against the wall always look like junk. So I'm going to suggest go with the floor heat. But when you do that, contact the company that you're planning on using and give them the dimensions and the specs and where you live and let them do the math for you and give you their suggestions on spacing and wattage and all that kind of jazz. Don't guess. It's the wrong time to be wrong is when you're all finished and you put the heat on and you get to a cold winter day and go, wow, really wish we would have used a little bit more. But now that the kitchen and the bathroom and all the furniture is in, right, that's the wrong time. So let these guys do the math and the science. You might end up buying a little more cable than you need, but there are sensors and thermostats. So it's better to buy a little bit more product up front than have the capacity to deal with a cold day than to be left a little bit wanting, right? That would really suck. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, Henri just sent us a super chat to say thanks for supporting the channel and what we do. Hey, uh, have I looked into geodesic dome homes as a cheap option? No, I haven't. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just guessing it's a dome home. That's interesting. You know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more... On the practical side, I don't try to look for every latest, greatest invention. Like I'm not, I'm not a, uh, a container home enthusiast or a tiny home enthusiast, generally speaking. I love the idea of smaller footprint, being more efficient, um, and being minimalist. I love all that. But uh, some of these things are just more designed for um, younger people, uh, no family right? Entry into the home market kind of stuff. And I think it's great. And, but yeah, I haven't looked into it. Uh, I'm probably going to need myself a good old fashioned trade show before I can bump into a lot of this stuff, to be honest with you. Kind of need like a good solid week in Orlando or Vegas or something where I can just go and see everything that everybody has to offer. 
but we don't have that opportunity again this year. So it's been robbed from us. Hopefully next February, we will be back to normal and I'll be able to find out all the new wonderful things that are going on in the world. But thanks for the tip. Uh, it'd be worth checking out. I should probably write that one down too. Let me just get this. Geo Desic Dome. Man, oh man. Okay, cool. Cheers, man. Uh, Linda, super chat. I know you can tile over tile, but what if my walls aren't plumb? Is there something I can do to avoid tearing everything out? Hmm. Why do you need plumb walls for tile? Tile is a water diversion system. So if your walls aren't plumb, the, the question really is, if you're worried about doing it right, okay, tile walls don't require a plumb wall. Um, the aesthetic of the room might require a plumb wall, but it doesn't mean that the bathroom systems that are surrounding the tile aren't going to function properly. So now we get into the quality of the finish. If you're considering tiling over tile, I'm going to guess that there's a budget constraint. So the best way to tile over tile is to just go ahead and do it. All right. Don't be too concerned about a plumb wall. If you have a specific issue with um, the functionality of a uh, glass door fixture or something you wanted to add that you need plumb, then you can build a wall with extra cement. You can buy different kinds of cements. So you can lay that cement half inch, three quarter inch thick, and you can build a, a tile wall from zero to hero. Okay. But you're going to want to use self leveling clips on the tiles. You're going to want to put in more cement than you need and then use a rubber mallet to kind of tap the tile back into position of where a level is use a laser line. It can be really messy and labor intensive, but yes, you can build something plumb on a not plumb surface out of tile and cement. You might want to even be a little patient and do a couple of rows a day, all right, depending on the size of the tile, because if you have too much tile and cement, it'll sag and the weight and a bow, and it won't be plumb again. So that'd be a problem. So um, patience is actually going to do a wonderful thing for you there, Linda. You can try that out. And that's about the best advice I got. Um, wow. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I just lost everybody here. There we go. I'm back in business. Okay. Uh, uh, so Luke asked me an interesting question here. Jeff, for fun, what is your least favorite type of work to do? Hold on. Let me just see here. Um, I love electrical. Oh, I know. My least favorite work to do is to unclog a frozen sewer line going out to the septic bed. That was so much fun last year. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to say that is my least favorite. Oh, my goodness. That was a real crappy day. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've got another super chat here from R.H. Harley. Two-year-old house. That's good to know. Any suggestions for insulating the garage exterior wall without having to dismantle or remove too much of the drywall? Hmm. That's really fascinating. Now, the best of my knowledge, the building code doesn't require you to drywall an exterior wall of a garage except under certain conditions. So if you have a drywalled garage and it's not insulated and you want to insulate it, um, if you don't want to remove the drywall, you could use a blown insulation. And you can literally just get on a ladder, drill a three inch hole, get up near the top, stick the pipe in, right? And then just turn on the, and fill it, okay? You're not gonna get a perfect insulation, obviously. But if you, bear in mind, this is like, if and if we've done this in, in the past with old houses that have plaster walls, okay, that we want to maintain the integrity of the plaster, we'll just drill a hole at the top of the cavity. It's all balloon frame construction, so the, the, the cellulose fill just goes down and fills up the cavity wall. It gets close. You get about ninety percent efficient, right? And if that's if that's important for you that you don't want to disturb the wall, then that's the way to do it, okay? 
And, and that should work really efficiently for you, okay? But remember, when you're blowing something in, that air has to go somewhere that you're creating pressure. So you actually have two holes, one that you're blowing in and one that the air is coming out. And some of the insulation is going to blow too. It's a little bit of a messy process. But like I said, uh, generally speaking, you can get enough insulation there that it'll dramatically change the atmosphere of the garage. And I'm not sure. I get a lot of people ask me about how to insulate the garage. And the question you need to ask yourself is, what are you insulating it for? If it's not insulated and it's just drywall, okay, and it's that cold, are you going to heat the garage as well? Because as soon as you add a heating system, now you don't have a vapor barrier system. You are going to have condensation at the drywall, and that's going to cause you problems, okay? Because that's where the hot and the cold are going to meet, and that's where the moisture is going to be left in the drywall. And the drywall is in contact with the wood, which is where the mold lives, and so then the mold will grow off that water, and you're in trouble. So you really got to think twice. Are you insulating the drywall in that wall cavity? so that it just makes the garage a little more comfortable, but you're not heating it, or are you plan on heating it? And if you plan on heating it, are you in the north and do they use salt on the roads and are you gonna keep your car in that garage? Because if you drive a car with salt water into a heated garage, I'm gonna guarantee you right now, you better not have a lease because your car isn't gonna last long enough for you to finish your lease period. Think about it. Gotta have an overall plan. Don't just ask me a question about a way to do something unless you, Tell me what your plan is. I need the goal. I need to know what's the space for, because there's so many right ways to do what you're asking to do right now that you could do five wrong and five right ways. Uh, the same answer is just really, really tricky. Uh, okay, so James is saying I barely have any time at the end of the day after a given project that I can't imagine spending additional time filming and having to do multiple takes and reduce. Ugh. Well, James, that's the secret. I don't do multiple takes and redos. <laughs> Max and I film, and when we're done, we're done. So we usually have one filming day a week, and on occasion, we might have him come out once or twice for some extra shots or, or whatever, depending on the project. But generally, we film once a week. We try to make two videos a week in that filming day, and generally, I'm still working while I'm filming because as you can see, I'm making stuff on camera. So I'm not being that inefficient, but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I do appreciate the fact that it is work. There's no doubt about it. Um, we just have great chemistry, man, Max. So we can knock this stuff out of the park. It's uh, it's kind of fun. It's a, uh, it's a rare thing. So we just love it. All righty. How the heck do you time find? Oh, that's the same guy, James. Same question, different format. <laughs> I, I don't find time, James. I make it. Yep, got to do it. It's true. It, it does take longer to renovate a house when you're doing everything on camera. But uh, that's okay. Not a problem. All right. Let's try, any ideas for a cost-effective way to make an unfinished basement with exposed fiberglass Ceiling and no egress windows, safe for kids to play. Okay. Yeah, the, the really the only issue you got there is the exposed fiberglass. You're going to have an air quality issue down there. If you take vapor barrier and cover up all of that exposed fiberglass, then you are going to be able to... Um, uh, Basically, run your furnace and, and put in a cold air return pipe. Make sure you have a cold air return in the basement. And after a couple of days, you'll have circulated all the air. The fibers will be in your filter, and the air will be decent quality to breathe. Um, egress windows were designed for people who are living and sleeping in a basement. So during the case of fire, while they're sleeping, they have an egress. If you are awake and the fire alarm goes off, you are not going to be caught by surprise in a basement. So I would not be too concerned about kids in a basement. Just don't give them matches. <laughs> All right. Um, for the record, a thousand square feet of vapor barrier is usually around 50 or 60 bucks. So it's about the most cost effective way you can build anything to create a nice, clean, safe space for your kids. Um, and uh, just let your kids be kids. They're going to love it. You give them a space like that to, to tear up. They're going to they're gonna think they've gone to heaven. What do you think of the way of tiling when there's loose sand or cement on the floor? Okay, 
So that's that's really old school and it's amazing, right? Um, nothing wrong with it. Like I said, there's more than one way to two tile. We we do tile on concrete, on on um, on sand, on dry pack. We tile on plywood. We tile on OSB. We tile on membranes. We tile on tile. We, we tile on everything. They're all the right way. If the assemblies and the products you're using under certain conditions, right? I mean, everything has got conditions and experience teaches you that. Remember when they brought thin set on the market back in the early 60s, the tiling world was turned on its head. Everybody had a new way of doing something and they all did it the wrong way for years until they figured out the proper requirements and assemblies and technologies to blend. Now we've come to the point where we understand it well enough that we can do a good job. There is no more excuse in the marketplace for a poor tile job other than being ill-informed and presenting yourself as an expert when you're not. That's for all of you out there looking to hire a tile guy. They aren't learning anymore. If they don't know what they're doing, it's because they don't want to learn what they're doing. They just want to get the contract, take your money and run. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm behind on the stream, but I'm in Montreal and the thought of spending 35,000 on my five by eight bathroom has me dying of laughter. <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, if you're going to do a renovation on a bathroom, it better be in need of a renovation, right? Your bathroom has to be in a place where it's now detracting from the value of your house. You can't just take any bathroom, throw in 35 grand and make money. That's stupid. Most renovations, you only get 60 cents on the dollar. But if your bathroom is in such rough shape that it's a detractor and you've lost value in your home because of the age and condition of it, then let's say your house is currently Montreal. Let's say your house is worth 650 or 700,000. All right. It's 30 years old. The rest of the house has been renovated, but the master bathroom hasn't. Well, and it's, it's, it's just a crappy looking bathroom at this point. All right. Well, you were going to be 650, but since your neighbor did their bathroom, now your house is only worth 630. Now, if you renovate your, put your 35,000 in, your house is back up to 630, 640. Do you understand? This is how we, it works. You know, your value goes up and then things get old and then it starts to peak and you start losing value and you got to fix it to get back on the, this is the way the world works, right? So lots of people buy a house and live in it for 20 or 30 years until it's all run down and then go to sell the house. And they get the same money for it as when they bought it because they let it go to garbage. Can't do that. Homes wear out. You, you, you got to keep on top of it. You got to invest. It's amazing. People buy a brand new car every four years and they'll never renovate their house. Anyway, expect them to last forever without any maintenance. Good luck. I'm going to be the tile guy with your videos. All right, Lydia. <laughs> sure. Uh, Jeff, if you get a chance, can you look at Gablock construction and give your thoughts? Gablock. Um, I'm not sure why I'm looking at them. If you're looking for me to give an opinion on another contracting firm and, and if that's a good firm to hire, the answer is no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, at some point, we are going to come up with a program where um, contractors and homeowners are going to agree to conduct business in a certain manner. And until we have time to put that together, uh, I just want to avoid the whole us versus them mentality because it's not that way at all. I will tell you this, though. I'm going to share this. Yeah, I got this time. I'm going to share a story. I had a member the other day contact me and they said, you know, I've got the shady contractor issue going on. Help me. All right. So can I just clear this up? Because I'm not pro-contractor or pro-homeowner when it comes to contracts. Contract is just a piece of paper or should be on paper. It's an agreement. It's an understanding. It's a, it's a way to establish expectations, establish price, protocols, procedures. These things are supposed to be between two intelligent, relatively educated people about what's going on that can make good decisions for themselves. There is a line of integrity, okay, where good business conducts business above the line and bad business conducts themselves below that line. And as a homeowner, if you choose to dip below that line of integrity to find someone to do your contracting and you end up in a bad spot, it's your own damn fault. Okay. 
don't cry me a river when you go and, oh, I got a contract, but we didn't sign a contract and things are bad. Ah. Look in the mirror. You chose that path. All right. If you can't afford to stay above the line, then take the time to learn how to DIY. The world is getting more polarized. The reason we did this channel is because so many of you can't afford to stay above the line when you hire. You've got to learn to do it yourselves. Okay? If you don't learn to do it yourselves and you try to get lucky, you can go to Vegas and roll the dice as much as you want. But don't come crying to me if things don't work out because that is just the cost of doing business. All right? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But I'm going to tell you right now, when you go believe that integrity line, you're going to lose more than you win. So just don't waste your time going there. If you can't afford it, do it yourself. All right? I'm not going to be getting in the business of, of trashing people who are, 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 are doing work for people because you both agreed and you both agreed to go play below the line. And if it goes to garbage, it goes to garbage for both of you. And you both deserve what you get. Done. Okay. I still love you all. But stay above the line or learn to do it yourself because I'm going to guarantee you, if you take the time to educate yourself and watch a few videos and practice, you will be a better contractor than most of the guys that are out there who are even above the line, okay? Because nobody does it right. Nobody. Nobody does it right. There's no such thing. you got to just find out what's right for you. Bob. Bob is just throwing us some love. Thanks, Bob. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, okay. So Gavlog is a product, not a kind. Cool. I wrote it down. Cheers, Roderick. I'm going to check it out. Um, you know, I, I have no problem checking out products. I just, you understand my hesitation with getting into the contractor world, right? Because there are some companies out there that come across, like they've got their stuff together and they're just crooks. And there's lots of guys out there who are just working hard and slugging away and will give you great service. And they get a bad rap because they're not a big firm and it's just not right. I know lots of guys who are small contractors who are great guys to work with. I know lots of firms that are massive and have great reputations and are horrible people. And it exists all over the place in the homeowner world too. There's good and bad homeowners. So it's an absolute wild west mess. So if you want to avoid the mess, make your own bed, right? Renovate your own house and avoid all that trouble. All right. Uh, let's get back into this a little bit. Okay, so Scrimmy just said, Jeff, he just bought an older home in Thunder Bay, Ontario. It contains asbestos in the vermiculite insulation. Can I remove it safely myself? <laughs> wow. Here's a question for you. Um, call up your insurance company and ask them. Okay. Because, yes, you can. If you can get your hands, go to Sunbelt Tool Rentals. They have uh, uh, insulation vacuum machines for sucking out old insulation. If you can rent the right equipment and you wear the right PPE and follow the right protocol and you can educate yourself and the insurance company is going to accept that as a removal because you get an environmental engineer in there to do testing of the air quality in the attic after you're done, perhaps you can satisfy everybody that you can get released as far as being asbestos free but once it's been declared to get rid of it it's sometimes as a, there's a few hoops to jump through so um you're gonna have to do a little bit of investigation there yourself sometimes the best thing is just don't drill any holes in the ceiling <laughs> it's okay if it's there if you don't disturb it it's not gonna cause anybody to get hurt all right steve thanks for the super chat steve cheers man i need to get my foundation leveled Oh, and I don't have the equipment to do it. Do you think any of my walls or flooring will crack when they level my foundation a couple of inches? Yeah, Steve. Oh, man, that's such a big question without a lot of information. So uh, your foundation leveled. If you have a poured foundation and it's not level. Let's do camera this way, not level. And you want to level it. That means what they're going to do is they're going to lift the framework of the house off the foundation and then backfill in that foundation to level it all off. 
Yeah. The, the more major the surgery you do with your structure, the more likely you're going to get cracking, right? I would say it's fair to assume that if you have tile work, it's in trouble. If you have hardwood flooring, whatever you have is in trouble. <laughs> it is really hard to do that dance and do it well. Um, if you want to elevate the expectation from the company and you get it in writing and saying, I need to know what the price is going to be for this kind of expectation, then do that. But don't just hire a company to do that for you and not have that expectation conversation. Okay. Don't just ignore it. And because then you're going to go, Oh, I got cracking. They're going to be like, of course you got cracking. We raised your bloody house. Right. Um, you're going to end that conversation. So the best way to answer your question, which is an expectation question, is to ask that question of the company you're thinking of doing business with and have them put it in writing and what they're going to do for you for compensation if it doesn't go well. Don't just say, yeah, we promise. Oh, but what if there's a problem? What are you going to do about it? What's my compensation? Put all that in writing. And if anybody is good in their business and they're confident enough what they're doing and they know how to do it and they got the team and the systems and the, and the experience to pull that off, and they're able to put that in writing for you, then you got the right guy. If they're not willing to do it, maybe it can't be done. I don't know. That's that's the world the leveling a house on a crooked foundation. I've never really had to get into that before. Usually in situations like that, the house has got such a low value, we just expect to gut it and rebuild it after we, we adjust, right? New flooring. If you plan on new flooring, you don't have to worry about it. Um, okay, so... Somebody wanted to buy the LED recess lights from our videos. Yeah, they're sold out. Here's the deal, guys. Um, it's COVID. And a lot of the products are coming from overseas. Uh, shipping lanes are slowing down. Um, there's a lot of supply issues all over the place. So they are constantly restocking and restocking, and they're selling fast. It's a great product at a great price. So if it's not there today, uh, check again next week. Um it's the best I can say. But until we get the world back to normal, the people that are helping to supply products for us, they're just they're, they're running into a lot of a lot of roadblocks. So it is tricky. All right. Uh, wow. Sorry about that. And, and Chrissy, thanks. Thanks for, for wanting to support us. I appreciate that. Um, you're in Niagara, Ontario. So if you're in Ontario, uh, There are lots of LED recess lighting available. You check check for um, lighting wholesalers. Sometimes it's the best other option. Okay, and just tell them you're looking for um, uh, low profile, uh, four inch LED, four thousand K lighting. That's the color temperature, and they'll be able to help you. All right. Cheers, Chrissy. Um, hey Jeff, where can you find She Rock Forty Five at? I've searched the blue and orange stores with no luck. Then you must be. In the United States, She Rock 45 is actually brand name for CGC. Um, down in the United States, you guys have, oh, God, I'm having a brain fart. Uh, it's a different 45. Somebody can put in the comments, probably help me out. But there's a 20, there's a 45, and there's a 90. And it just has a different preface, okay? But same technology made by an American company instead of a Canadian one distributed in the United States instead of Canada. I'm using Canadian products, so it can be a little confusing at times. But 45 just simply means it has a hardening compound in it, and that's the expected working time of the product when you're using soft water and it's cold water. Yeah. So you have 45. If you go to your orange and blue stores and you go into the drywall compound area and you find that bag and it says 45 on it, whatever else it says on it, just buy it. That's the stuff. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Uh, Patrick, thanks for the super chat, bud. Uh, bonsoir. Wow, very cool. Thank you for the hard work and guidance to finish my ceramic tile shower and doing my deck next spring. Hey, cheers. You know, I'd love to hear that. I'm glad you guys are just watching for fun, but you're actually maybe learning something to help you along the road of life. That is cool. I'm loving what I do for a living. Not too many people can say they make a living helping people. All right, Connor has a granny flat that is newly built and has electrics and plumbed for everything except it doesn't have central heating. Do you have any recommendations to heat the place? 
Well, if you don't have central heating, then you must be far enough south that it's not really a requirement because <laughs> that'll be part of your building process and your, your code and your permit to have a heating supply. Um, if you want some sort of central heating, you also need to have a, a furnace and a trunk line and ducting. Um, wow, can't help you. If you want to sub, 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 if you want to add a little bit of heat, supplement heat, you can put in-floor heating systems in for just about any flooring. We're going to do that video soon because the world has changed and now everybody can have heated floors and it doesn't matter what product you want to finish with. Yeah, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be amazing. All right. Uh, Optimus Prime is hanging out in Boston right now. That's cool. Just had my ceiling tile installed. Looking for the LED lights. Yeah, we're having supply issues as well. Sorry. Um, you, you can get them in other places. Oh, there you go. Spartan, thanks, man. USG Easy Sand 45 is the answer to the 45 question. Like I said, it's nice that they call it Easy Sand, too, because it's not always easy to sand this stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, okay. Let's get to another question here. I would like to know how to find the under padding for laminate flooring you mentioned in your laminate video. Could not find on the site you mentioned. Hmm. I was on the site the other day and it was on the first page. Um, there's a lot of different places to sell a good quality under pad. If you're, if you're having difficulty finding it, try going to floor and decor. They have some great pads. Try using Google and search um, flooring supply wholesalers. Okay, um, that'll usually get you a popularity list of local guys in town that are open at 6 or 6.30 in the morning, Monday to Friday only, and they'll sell to the public. You can go in and say, I just need the greatest quality dense under pad for this type of flooring, and they'll give a couple of options for you. Usually it's around 25, 30 cents a square foot, and you're going to love the fact that Google can do that much in such a short period of time for you. Um, I know we, we do have... Uh, you know, people that try to help to supply products to make life easy. But during COVID, it is not always easy. So it's good to have a backup plan. Uh, how to install a whole piece of backsplash for the kitchen? Well, yeah, if you're going to use one piece of stone, that's simple. Contract it out. You know, the same guy that cuts it will deliver it. And that's half the battle. Getting a long piece of stone in one piece to the job site is tricky. Um, at that point, it's only a few bucks for them to stick it on the wall. So... Uh, I would do it that way. Uh, I wouldn't even do that myself. Someone here is uh, saying, I have wood wall paneling in my new house. Would you change it? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I guess if it's a new house, is it your new house or is it a new house? <laughs> There's a difference. If everybody in the neighborhood has it, then they all bought a house with wood paneling too. So it must be pretty. Um, if it's just a new house to you, I would say wood paneling is really not a trendy material right now. I would probably change it out. Um, I'd probably go with drywall and paint. And yeah, definitely. Cheers. Bob! Bob is in the house. Cheers from Orlando. Now, if you don't know, Bob uh, actually was one of the only people that ever made it to our speaking tour last year before it was canceled from the COVID mess. And um Oh, that's cool. Bob's cheers from Orlando. That is nice. Good to hear from you, Bob. Bob. Hang on a second. Yeah, I missed one here. Kelsey, you have a question. Who should I reach out to? My garage leaks from the ceiling. Hmm. And the ceiling roof is my porch flooring and half of it's uncovered. Reached out to a few different companies with no luck. Okay, so you're going to just call a roofing company. Okay. Yeah, I would call a roofing company, Kelsey. It's a very strange time of year, and you don't mention here where you live, but um, sometimes a roofing company can deal with something like that um, early in the winter before there's too much snow load, and they can do a really good job of sealing something up. Uh, it's tough, you know, hiring contractors during COVID and in the winter, it can be a real challenge. The, the other advice that you can get, um, 
is if it's causing damage, right, to your house, and it's substantial enough, you can call your insurance company, and then that restoration company will take care of the repairs. But it sounds to me like you have a leak and you have a problem and you like to address it before it becomes a major problem. If you can't, try calling a handyman company and ask them to just try to um, seal it up for the winter time until you can get roofing crews out there that are more available. Yeah, that's tough. Ay, ay, ay. You know, and if, and if, and if you're really stuck, um, consider joining our membership program. Send me pictures of what's going on. And, you know, I might be able to give you some advice how you can put some temporary repairs in place so that you can protect your investment. Um, a lot of times buying uh, blue tarps from Home Depot and, and some one by four strapping and you put it in the tarp and then you just roll it over a couple of times and throw in some screws. Usually that's good enough temporary repair to give you a relatively waterproof roof for at least six months. So that's a technique you can use. But without pictures to really understand what's going on there, it's tough to advise. But um, yeah, that's, that's tough. Kelsey, uh, try to grab yourself a hold of a roofer. That's my best advice. All right. We got 15 minutes left, ladies and germs, and uh, we're out of here. So uh, if you got a question, feel free to throw it at me. We still have 800 people watching this show right now. That is crazy. Cheers, guys. Love you. Hope some of this is helping. You to do everything the right way. Yeah, right? All right. Uh, okay. Had a question. The painter wants to charge me $1,800 for four rooms. What do you think? Ceiling and everything. I don't know. Is any good? <laughs> What's your house worth? Um, 800 bucks, eh? Uh, are, are you capable of painting? Is that something you would tackle? Uh, you could follow a couple of our videos and a few gallons of paint and do it probably for two to 300. Just saying. But for 1800 bucks, yeah, four rooms and ceilings and everything is probably going to be three days. Uh, if you're running a business, you'd charge 600 bucks a day. Damn straight. Because the government's going to take the first 200 right out of the gate. And they still got to buy the material. So, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer to me. Seems like pretty reasonable price. But, you know, you want to make sure that he knows how to paint first. Make sure. <laughs> See if you can go take a look at some of the work that he's doing right now before he comes to your place. Because there is a lot of different quality of painter out there. And you got to manage your expectation. The best way to do that is go take a look at what he's painting today. So call him up and say, hey, where are you, where are you working today? I'd like to come by and see the kind of work you're doing. And if that scares the living daylights out of you or out of him, then that's a really good answer to whether or not you want him in your house. All right. little tip. Uh, Jeff wants to skim coat my walls and ceilings to make walls look better. Can you recommend the best mud to use for that? Yeah, sure. All-purpose regular drywall compound. It's the easiest to sand. And the trick is, is you take the mud and you add a little bit of water to thin and loosen it up a little bit. Okay. It sands so much easier that way. And it'll apply really nice too. So really it's, uh, it's the best, best bang for your buck. All purpose drywall mud. Boom. All right, here we go. I got to get up my super chest. I'm in behind. Oh, 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 there's Brian's. Faisal. I bet I got that right. I had a guy in my class when I was young. His name was Faisal Suziwala. Never forgot that. That name just stuck to me like blue. I don't know why. But uh, Faisal, you, got, you own an 1880 rental. I own an 1880 rental that's been renovated 10 years ago. Okay, but the floors are sloped towards the center. Is it worth fixing it by shimming the joists or just keeping it? One end of a bedroom is five-inch floor. <laughs> five inches is pretty substantial. But you know what? The crazy thing is, even though there's a major slope, when you have that bowl effect in an old house, if you fix one floor, then you have a door. Then you got to fix the hallway. You got to fix the next room. You got to fix everything. You got to do the whole unit. Now, if you want to fix all of that on an old unit, you got to understand the reason it sloped in the first place is because the house is 1880 and everything was put together with just nails. There's no joist hangers. There's no screwed. There's no... There's no brackets. There's no load transfer other than the nail. And as things dry out over time, 
and the weight continues to happen. The nails are bending because they were not engineered for the weight and everything's slowly shifting and sagging and sinking. So if you're going to go through the trouble of peeling up all the floors and then leveling off all the floors and closing it up again, make sure you get underneath the bit and stabilize the structure so it stops moving anymore. Okay, that's the key. Stabilizing that structure by adding floor joists or a couple of support posts, something to keep it from getting any worse. You won't be able to lift it all back in place, but if you want to stabilize it and then fix your floor joist package of the whole house as, as a one-time repair, you can. The other thing you can do, I know this is going to sound a little crazy, but if you leave the slope and then you put in a DIY bed, okay, you can actually build the bed that's level on a slope floor and you can make your own bed and attach it to the floor so it's not always sliding across them. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I'm doing in my house because I have the same thing going on in my farmhouse. So I'm actually building my own bed on my own frame and I'm going to attach it to the floor so it isn't moving around. Uh, so cheers to that. Um, one is a do-it-yourself bed program and it's just a platform bed and then you buy a mattress and the mattresses that you buy and have delivered to the house they're brilliant. The, this, this new wave of technology and mattresses that's out there, we've got a company that supplies mattresses to people for it. You can check out the link in our, in our, on our webpage. But there, it's a brilliant quality. We use that in our, um, in, our, in our loft there, right, with the Murphy bed. I'm sleeping on it right now, and we are having a great sleep on that thing. So if you made your own bed, who's the guy that did that? Um, I think it was, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, Modern Builds, right? The guy from Modern Builds on YouTube made that bed, okay? It's a platform bed. It's a good design. If you follow that and buy a mattress to fit it, you're going to be perfectly happy. And it's a good place to spend your money. And then the, all the slope, we call that charm. If it's a rental, I wouldn't really invest in fixing the floor. It's really opening up a can of worms. All your doors will be the wrong size. All your casings have to be adjusted. All your baseboards have to be peeled off and reinstalled. 1880, that means plaster and lap and all kinds of nightmare. Do yourself a favor, all right? Just build your own bed and you'll be just cool. That'll be awesome. Oh, wow. Whew. When are you coming to Seattle to sheetrock my house? <laughs> Never! <laughs> <laughs> oh, cheers, Brian. Thanks for the super chat, bud. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm planning on coming to Seattle. I, I, I'm, I have a lot of plans. It's so hard to execute a plan right now because just when we were getting to normal, we're back in lockdown again. Um, you know, we finally got vaccines on the market. Thank God for that because now we're going to be able to maybe get our life back together and make more plans. We're just trying to continue our renovations, keep the information, the videos coming. Uh, I'm planning on doing all these live shows in the next couple months, every Tuesday night, guys. All right. So hopefully we'll be able to help a lot of people when they're in the research mode, when you're planning for your spring and your summer projects. Um, I'm going to put a bunch of different kind of information together and then answer questions every week. So hopefully this was helpful. I'm going to try to finish it up here right now if I can. I don't know if I can. Uh... George says, super chat here. I'm trying to find an alternative to making an exterior hole for my bathroom ventilation system. I'm unable to drill holes slash change the small window due to condominium rules. Any ideas? Huh. You have a condominium that has a rule that you can't add an exhaust for your bathroom? Wow. What a lovely building. Um, hmm. That's amazing, George. Like, if the condominium won't let you upgrade to having an exhaust fan, then the best option that you have really is to put in the water-resistant blue drywall on the ceiling, okay, and go with a 100% um, acrylic paint. And then when you're done with your shower, leave the bathroom door open. And if you need to, 
If you like long showers, even get a small fan from the hallway blowing into the bathroom at the bottom of the door, and that'll circulate the air to the rest of the house. At least that way you can move the moisture from one small space into a shared space, and the whole apartment or condo will be able to absorb the impact of that moisture a lot better than just one room, okay? Um, the worst thing you can do would be to finish and then close the door, right? That's tricky. But you know what? If you do that and you don't add the fan, then what you're going to end up with is every 50 years, you've got to do that bathroom guaranteed. Most people do a bathroom every 20 to 30 years anyway, but you'll, you'll get up to 50 years if you're going to do that. Leave the door open, add a fan if you want to. Um, yeah, there you go. Very cool. Well, listen, I just wanted to say cheers, guys. I'm going to call it a night. My back's starting to kill me. I don't think this chair is as comfortable as it should be. I'm going to be in mood for another one. And my wife is calling me. Hang on a second. Hey, baby, what's up? <laughs> I think that's her, her courtesy call to let me know that I'm almost out of time. Listen, I just wanted to give some shameless plugs here. Oh. I don't know why she's calling again. Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah. Yes, baby, what's up? Are you done? Your no, I'm, I'm still live, babe. Okay, um, <laughs> there are two super chats you haven't um, dealt with. Okay. Okay, and they are, um, give me a sec. Gotta love hey. a good wife. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Schluter, and then there is, um, hold on, I'm going through this. Tony Yuhana. Okay, hold on. I just got to Matthew Schluter. Hi, and Jeff. And then Deep Mindfulness. Okay, one second. Where do you buy your MLV rolls in Ottawa? You can't. Mass loaded vinyl is not available for sale in Canada right now. I got it from the contractor in the States um, who supplies the United States, and they paid to have it shipped across the border for me. But generally speaking, it's not available. Unfortunately, if you're looking for uh, soundproofing for an underpad, there are great dense underpads. You can get that in Ottawa at Dragona. You can talk to them for that. All right. Cheers. Next. What do we got, baby? Tony Iguhana. I'm just going backwards in time. Uh-oh. I can't go further back for some reason. Uh-oh. What was Tony's question? <laughs> Taking care of business. Tony Yuhana, where did he go? Okay, uh, he lives in Chicago. Family will be living down there. Should I lay down DMX or plateau over vinyl tile or remove the tile and glue first? 5.8 OSB will go over the DMX. Right, so if you're using my subfloor system, Tony, and you have existing glued down vinyl, um, first, if it's an older house and it's nine by nine vinyl tile, it's asbestos tile, so don't remove it. Having said that, vinyl tile glued to concrete in a basement can be covered with our subfloor system. It has zero negative impact on the atmosphere or your building conditions, and it won't affect you at all. So I say save yourself the time and the struggle. Go right over top of your new subfloor and just move on with your day. And that is the right way to do things. All right, baby. Is, is that everybody? We got one more. No, we got uh, two more deep mindfulness. I don't know somehow you just skipped over them. I guess. Well, yeah. When I stop to read a question, then then the feed gets weird, and then when I move the cursor, it just zips me right to the end. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your help. Uh, okay, I'm looking for it. Yeah. I thought you already answered deep mindfulness. Oh, I can't even go back that far. Really? Yeah, I can't go back that far. Oh, nuts. Okay. Um. Tell deep. So deep my mindfulness, tell him, repost his question. Yeah, yeah. So if you're deep mindfulness and you're still watching, please repost your question. Um, okay. And lastly, James Hampton. I called a while back about deck boards bowing over a root cellar. Could I put down quarter inch plywood, DMX bubble, like in the basement, and then composite deck boards? 
Okay, I'm making the deck boards bowing over the roots. Yeah. Say hi, James Hampton. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to go. Okay, so if you, yeah, okay, James. So if you're doing the deck boards over top of the root cellar, which is a concrete structure, um, and you want to put down composite, what you need in order to install composite boards is some sort of a sleeper, something to attach the composite deck boards fastener to. So that, that, that sleeper can be installed to the concrete root cellar with a four season PL premium adhesive, okay? And you can even shim that with cedar shims. And then you can run your composite right on top of that. And then you have enough meat there that you can put your clips in. Um, James, if you would like to, you remember, why don't you send me a quick picture on the form? All right, and I'll have a second look at your situation there. And I'll be able to get back to you tomorrow on that, all right? I'll be happy to help. All right, and then for anybody else, if we didn't get to your question or you'd like to get more help with your stuff, then consider joining our membership program. Michelle, was there anybody else that we missed? Uh, deep mindfulness got back to us. Our building is switching to electric heat. Okay. To save money, how do I create a tight envelope and find leaks? Drywall, walls, thick cement floor, add layers? Okay, so here, let's take a look at this. Uh, Switching to electric heat from what? That's the weird question, eh? Probably say, old hot water. Say deep mindfulness, so I'm answering your question. Yeah, deep mindfulness. Let's answer your question. Feel free to type in some more information. Yes. No, it's not. Okay. Um, okay, I'll let you go. Okay, thanks, babe. All okay. right, so you guys are switching from gas to electric heat. Right. Okay. And... To save money, how do I create a tight envelope and find leaks? Uh, okay. So if you want to define leaks, if you actually have like air gaps, they do make a, a pen and it has, it's a smoke pencil really is what it's called. And you can go to the hardware store and say, I need to buy a smoke pencil and they'll take it down there and show you. And what it does is it just makes smoke. And you can run it over all the corners and joints and around your windows and stuff. And, and the smoke will actually blow when there's air movement. And it'll identify a leak for you. And that is a great way to find all that stuff. As far as efficiency for your envelope, yeah, when they're pulling stuff and putting stuff back in, um, an expansion foam gun usually solves a lot of problems. <laughs> but the smoke pencil is a great tool to identify problems that need to be addressed. So you can try that out. And hopefully that is uh, enough information to help you out. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. I'm going to do this again next Tuesday. Okay. Same time, same bat channel. All right. So uh, if you got questions or you, uh, you got a whole week to find a question. <laughs> All right. This has been good. Now, I don't know what I'm talking about next week, but I promise by the time I get to next week, I'll have the, uh, the subject matter for my conversations line up for the next few weeks so that you can organize which show you'd like to be a part of. That would be great. Uh, don't forget to check out our Reality Renovation channel. We are starting season four next Friday. It's going to be amazing. I am so excited about what Max has done over there. The content is amazing. Uh, you can check out our channel and video links and all that kind of stuff on YouTube. Uh, it's called Reality Renovation if you want to search it. Make sure you subscribe to that channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Those videos are going to come out about every three weeks. And we're going to take you on the rest of the journey from the whole farmhouse renovation. I've only got a couple months left and I'm going to be finished it. Really excited to get that done. This has been a long time in the, in the, in the coming. And uh, then soon we'll be on to our next project. And hopefully we'll be able to reveal that to you soon. So cheers to everybody in the DIY Nation. Cheers, Sandy. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Michelle, my wife, my lovely wife, for saving my bacon. And um, if you're a member and we didn't get to your question today, or feel free to jump into the forum. We'll see you guys there. Cheers. <laughs>